This week on CrossFeed. Jesus Times 2000. The right to celebrate Seinfeld style. iTunes and free speech. Jesus was a wine guzzling what? In religious or not in religious artwork. Hello, everybody. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church of North Ridgeville, Ohio. And I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out in pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just slightly the other side of uh, Foxborough, where currently Green Bay leads the New England 9-7. to But don't count New England out yet by a long shot. <laughs> Yeah, well, you guys got a pretty good advantage in that our great quarterback is out of the game. So, you know, um, I am surprised, actually, that, wow, that just happened, too. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm not watching the game. I'm watching the Twitter feed. <laughs> so, um, the, um, I'm not either. So, uh, um, yeah, oh, I imagine it's going to. Like, we've already clinched the division, so, you know, we may be taking it a little easy waiting for the playoffs. Relax! You guys haven't done that yet. You actually have to play still. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'll tell you, living in Cleveland, it, it's hard to keep up with the Packers. Um, I'm not one to go and look up scores, and, and uh, I mean, I, I check the scores after the weekend, um, but if I can't actually watch the game, uh, you know, I don't keep track of how much do they need to win and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I just like watching the games and, uh, and I only, I only watch the Packers. And so it's, it's pretty rare that I get to actually watch a game. Um, so I can, I can hear it going on in the other room. My wife's watching it, but she's further back. Um, because she just started watching it not too long ago on the TiVo. So we all start watching it late so you can zip past the commercials. Yes, so it should, should probably I, be live by the time we're done recording. Quite familiar with it. We'll see how it goes. <clears throat> well, I hope you're ready for Christmas this weekend. Um, Yeah, almost. We had our children's Christmas program today. So did we. Had really nice turnout, Um, you know, just as far as attendance numbers uh, goes. And um, and the, the kids did a really phenomenal job. We've got... We've got some really great kids that, um, you know how like a lot of times with the older kids, they don't want to sing and, and stuff like that. And they just kind of stand there like lumps and, but our kids don't do that. Um, now we've got kids that don't come to Sunday school and if their parents forced them to come, they would just stand there like lumps. But, um, but <laughs> as it works out, um, it, even though it's a smaller crew, they're all pretty much into it and. We even had uh, some of the high school kids were um, did some pre-service music. They sang portions from Handel's Messiah and and stuff like that. And um, you know, they they learned it in in their high school choir, and then they taught it to uh, some of the adults here. And and uh, it was it was pretty cool. So um, so yeah, it was it was a really nice morning. Yesterday we had our Jesus birthday party, um, and uh, had some. Uh, kids from the preschool came to that, um, along with some kids from our church, and um, and that was that was kind of neat. We've we've got a woman that that every year does a um, telling the Christmas story from Mary's perspective, and she starts out with creation and the Garden of Eden and talks about sin coming into the world and and the whole thing and, and just sort of lays it out. It kind of reminds me of um, of uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon where he sort of you know, lays out the whole history and everything. And, um, and, uh, and, and she, and then she, you know, eventually gets to, to Mary and Christmas and, and all that. And then, um, continues on through the crucifixion and resurrection and stuff like that. So it's just, she does a phenomenal job. And I, I've thought about, you know, recording it and, um, and, and posting it online so other people could see it because she just does, does such a great job of it. But I thought, well, I don't want anybody watching it and then not coming. <laughs> so maybe I'll record it someday and and just hold on to it, and then when she stops doing it, then we'll post it. 
But, uh, so she starts off with creation and then talks about Mary, the birth, the whole thing. But then she talked about Festivus or Festivus. Festivus. All right. Um, no, no, she doesn't. Um, because it's fake. <laughs> All right, so all you Seinfeld fans, the funny thing is I was never, I, I enjoyed watching Seinfeld when there was nothing else on, but I was never a big fan of the show. Um, just had better things to do. But um, this was kind of, this was one of those big stories um, that's sort of amusing. Um, that in uh, uh, Orange County, California, uh, a guy by the name of Malcolm Alamo King um, decided that he didn't like the uh, salami prison food, and uh, and said, you know, I'd I'd really rather um, have something better tasting, like some kosher food. And uh, there he is. And uh, he said, uh, I, you know, I celebrate Festivus, and so you need to feed me different foods, and I should get double portions of that good stuff, and and all that kind of thing. And they said, oh. Oh well, we have to, you know, honor your religious uh, uh, convictions or whatever, and uh, so uh, we'll have to give that to you. And he actually got away with it. Yes, there is a judge who apparently was not a Seinfeld fan, and um, and stuff. And so, uh, 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 um, he says, uh, Sheriff's Commander Dave Wilson says some people at the jail at the station eventually realized King's claim probably wasn't legitimate. So after about two months of the kosher meals, the county got the order thrown out of thrown out in court. We never did find out exactly. I mean, was this like Jewish kosher kosher meals? I mean, what do you mean by kosher meals? I mean, yeah. yeah. My religion says I have to have filet mignon every night, double <laughs> portions. Yep. <laughs> I. I, I gotta hand it to the guy for being creative. <laughs> Didn't really hurt anything except, you know, a little extra drain on our taxes f um, to pay for whatever the food was. Because uh, you can bet that it was more expensive stuff. Um, but nothing real serious. I, <laughs> I just. It, it cracks me up. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking, was there nobody. I mean, Seinfeld being as popular a show as it was, was there nobody at the prison that went, oh, come on? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, w I wouldn't, have, I never watched the show, so I wouldn't have known. I mean, who would know? I mean, it was a show about nothing. So, nobody, you know, really would pay attention, you know. But, but yeah. I wonder if he did he have the aluminum pole though, because you're supposed to have an aluminum pole and air your grievances. I wonder if he, you know, had the aluminum pole. Well, to do something. He had steel poles, <laughs> lots of them. <laughs> ah, well, depending on which jail, yeah, it could be. You know, a lot of them don't have those anymore though. But um, mm, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. But yeah, he he should have had some a uh, a uh, uh, a festivus nativity scene. Oh, there you go. Or or a whole bunch of them? Yeah, a whole bunch of them. 2,000 of them? Um, yeah. So, a church down in Florida is trying to set a new world record for the most nativity scenes displayed in one place. Uh, the Oasis Church in Pembroke Pines had 2,150 2, nativity scenes in their church sanctuary. Um potentially breaking the current world record by 350 scenes. Uh, but there is a slight glitch. It can only be attributable to human error. Because the uh, record, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, is um, for permanent displays. And this display, this, this, and they have um, for a you know, this was only there for two weeks, so it's not a permanent display. Right. So, um, I'm thinking they must have a really huge sanctuary. It's a big church. I, I, I was curious, and I went to check out their website. Um, and, uh, in fact, I was looking for it so I could get the... I had it. Here we go. 
um, I had, I wanted to get a picture, clear this off here, um, and, oh, that's small. That's a very small picture. Yeah, here, let me blow that up a bit. I had, sorry about the mess. A little bigger, a little bigger. That's all the bigger I can make it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, man, a little bigger, cover your face up completely. <laughs> um, but you can you can go to their website. I don't have it off the top of my head, but um, I mean, you know, it's it's a big church. They've got like five full time uh, pastors. Although you know, this isn't a. They're they're different churches have different definitions of pastors. Uh, in the Lutheran Church, um, you have to be ordained to be called a, a pastor, whereas in other churches, just like the youth director is called the youth pastor, and um, so that's that's one way. Just that we have a difference in practice in how we use that term. Um, or there's the children's pastor. My personal favorite, of course, was the place that had a minister of office affairs. Most churches are called a secretary, but yeah, yeah, or office administrator, but yeah, minister of office. I was like, do you have affairs going on in your office? <laughs> oh, Jim. So anyway, um, by the way, uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, so they've got um, the, the 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 for sure record is um, Andrea Adrichetti, who has eighteen hundred nativity sets in the. Uh, Museo del Sogni e Dello Memoria in Feltre, in Italy. So my Italian's not too good here, folks. So you you figure it out. Um, but that, like I said, that's a permanent exhibit, and this was just a temporary exhibit. So Guinness is going to have to decide whether or not this counts. So on the other know, hand, I, this was something kind of interesting in that I just found this out that that um, nativity scenes are from Italy. Yeah, you know, like Christmas trees are from Germany, and um. And so nativity scenes are from Italy, and, and so, um, you know, it's something that we go, how can you have Christmas without a nativity scene, you know? It, and, you know, people get up in arms when they don't want to put one up in a certain community. I mean, like, people could, the, they could say, well, we don't have any Italians in the community, so that's why we're not having a nativity scene on the courthouse lawn, you know? Um, um so Italian stables only have uh, three sides to them. Three, I, I mean, you know, I don't have a back wall and the other three sides are open. I have no idea what that meant. What you mean? From... Well, every nativity scene, the stable, has a back wall and oh. the other three sides are open. Yeah. <laughs> and has a roof on it. I mean, it's got to be the world's worst stable. I mean, there's nothing there to protect the animals from the air. There's <laughs> nothing there to protect the animals from, from anything. You know, it's got to be cold there. You know, I just got so that's an Italian stable, huh? Okay. <laughs> it's for display purposes only. <laughs> oh, okay. I just, you know. no, actually, my beef with most nativity scenes is that Jesus is always, like, just about naked. <laughs> you know? I mean, like, what, what do we know about, you know, we don't really know a whole lot. We don't know, was this a, a wooden stable or was it, were they in a cave? Um, you know, chances are it was probably in a cave. Um the you know what sort of animals were there or or whatever um you know the only reason that we figure there's animals there is because there's a feeding trough for animals there so chances are there's also animals there you know and and so but um but the one thing that we do know is she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger and every time you see it he's like there's like this um sort of cloth sort of draped across um his uh his groin area and then sort of like a diaper but a lot of times not even wrapped like a diaper and and then he's like sprawled out <laughs> like swaddle that child <laughs> well um kenneth bailey the new testament scholar says that um uh, mary actually instead of being in a outdoors at all or even in a cave he argues that uh it was a section of house and uh but where the animals would be kept inside the house at, at night and um that the inn there is not a motel six but really kind of a guest room in the house um and actually that's that's where i'm picking up my uh uh, uh, uh my sermon for christmas eve 
uh, there's no room for them in the end. And I'm talking about uh, that really this was not a, an inn. This was a, a, a private home, uh, probably family. And um, the thing is, is there was no room for them. Mary and Joseph had disgraced the family um, oh. by their pregnancy. Nobody in the family wanted anything to do with them. They, they There had been room for somebody else, but there's no room for them uh, in the guest room. But you couldn't just, but she was pregnant, so you, you couldn't just put her out on the street, so they stuck her in the stable with oh. the animals. That's supported by the text because that's something that, that, that grabbed my attention with the text is in the Greek, it, it, it says, for them, there was no room in the inn. That's, right. that's how it's actually, the emphasis is on for them in that sentence. Right. And so my uh, uh, question that I, I, I'm asking is, isn't that the question we all wonder? In God's inn, is there room for me? Huh. Or am I the disgraced person that gets thrown out? Cool. So, yeah, that's, that's my Christmas Eve. So, Dude, I want to come to uh, your church. <laughs> <laughs> Well, today I talked about how, uh, uh, about, uh, the, the Chiefs and the Raiders, so, you know, we, uh, uh, um, but anyhow, so, but my favorite comment, go back to the, our, our nativity scene here, but my favorite one here is, uh, it's not clear whether or not the fact that theirs is not a permanent collection will cause Oasis Church to lose out on the official record. Still, the attempt brought the church a fair amount of positive publicity, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Not necessarily, yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably probably a pretty good thing. Hey, for a church to be known for, well, you know, we're 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 doing something to tell people what Christmas is all about. <laughs> I think this is a really good idea. <laughs> and we know what Christmas is all about. It's all about the birth of a wine guzzling vagrant and precocious socialist. <laughs> so uh. that's. You know, that's, everybody knows that. <laughs> Even Linus. They, didn't you ever watch a Charlie Brown Christmas? And he says, you know, and unto them, but the, the angel said, unto you is born a wine guzzling vagrant, precocious socialist. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we uh, move over to Jim's Neck of the Woods, New Hampshire. Um, and at Bedford High School. A finance class of all things. You know, a finance class having um, problems in ending up in religious news. But, sure enough, um, they are reading a book called Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting By in America by Barbara uh, Ehrenreich. And she talks about her experience as an undercover journalist working minimum wage jobs and investigating the impact of the 1996 welfare reform on the working poor. And in the book, uh, she describes a tent revival meeting that she's at. And she says, this is the quote, It would be nice if someone would read the sad-eyed crowd, the Sermon on the Mount, accompanied by a rousing commentary on income inequality and the need for a hike in the minimum wage. But Jesus makes his appearance here only as a corpse. The living man, the wine-guzzling vagrant and precocious socialist, is never once mentioned nor anything he ever had to say. Oh, good grief. Okay, so my first reaction to this was, wow. So she went to this meeting, but clearly she wasn't really paying attention to what they were saying because um, she went there looking for economic help um, or, or economic encouragement, and that's not what Christianity is about. <laughs> um, if like, I tried my church to stand up and start talking about uh, do, you know, doing the Sermon on the Mount and talked about income inequality and the need for a hike in the minimum wage, I'd be run out of my church on a rail. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because that's not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. <laughs> it's about... It's not? <laughs> I know. I know. Pretty shocking. So, uh, well, here's the... I feel so disillusioned. <laughs> Next thing you're gonna start telling me it's all about you know you know God and you know you know blessing us in kind of strange strange ways there and you know that maybe God's system isn't what we think it is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty radical concept, and that uh, 
that he's going to take care of us even when when things get rough for us and 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 stuff like that. Yeah, you know. And the thing is, the the irony is that there is something in the Sermon on the Mount ab- ab- about you know um, some you know comfort, you know, bless the poor and that sort of thing. But not it's not bless the poor. It's blessed are the poor. It's not blessed are you when you raise the minimum wage and, uh, you know, tear down the rich and make us all, all, you know, you know, have the same amount of money everywhere. I'm sorry. It doesn't put it this way. The Sermon on the Mount does not belong in an economics class. So, I mean, ironically, her, her comment about Jesus that I just sort of like, yeah, whatever you, you know, and I thought of a wine guzzling vagrant. Well, that's actually sort of descriptive <laughs> because I'm not sure about the precocious socialist though. Yeah. You know, I think she's reading into a few things there, but the, the wine guzzling vagrant, he was actually kind of called that in his day. That's right. Yep. You know, John the Baptist disciples fast, and um, why don't yours? Uh, you know, and, right? And then, yeah, and he called a drunkard and a few other things. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I can, you know, I, you know, you just know this book is being used in class. I, I wonder what, I, I, what the point of using it is. Well, you know, yeah. and uh, I guess, you know, I would sat down with the teacher and said, well, I, you know, you know, I wouldn't got so upset about how to describe Jesus. I would have said, so um, you're not giving up your money because you're in socialism and you're, you're taking home your paycheck? <laughs> you're not giving it away? Right. Why don't you practice what you preach? You know, set the set the example for all of us. You yeah. know, but as Margaret Thatcher very famously said, the only problem with socialism eventually is you run out of other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was reading the article one time about somebody that... Um, they were at a restaurant and the person was wearing a, I don't know if it was a, I forget, like it was an Obama button or something like that, but it, it was some sort of sort of pro um, socialism kind of thing anyway. Um, the person that was writing this was very conservative and, um, and they said, uh, they said, so, you know, because they were really in favor of sort of, you know, giving money to the poor and, and, and stuff like that, um, I left a note. Instead of a tip, I left a note saying, "I'm giving to your tip. I'm giving your tip uh, to the homeless guy that's sitting outside." <laughs> I wonder how she felt about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyway, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I just, I don't know. Well, it's the fact that you know, my problem with this is that. That the teacher is pushing a political agenda um, instead well, of teaching economics. Yeah, back to our book here. I mean, yeah, it's been interesting. You know, I wonder if anybody, you know, if, if this Aaron Reich talked to anybody at the revival and said, "Well, what would you have thought if he'd been up there preaching about this, about e- income equality, inequality, and pushing for a rise, the, raise the minimum wage?" Something tells me they would have said, "Why would he be doing that here?" Mm-hmm. That's not what this is all about. This is a revival. Yeah, it's not a political rally. Yeah, it's not a political rally. If you want a political rally, go 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 get a politician. Yeah. How would you like it if somebody started got up um during the, you know, Democratic National Convention or the Republican one for that matter and uh and started preaching about the resurrection of Christ? <laughs> it doesn't belong there. That's not the place for it. You know. Um, but okay, so what actually did happen is uh, Dennis Taylor says his 16 year old son was so upset over the book that he's now being homeschooled. Wow, um, what's he gonna do when he goes off to college? Unless you're gonna send him to like Bob Jones or Oral Roberts or you know, or something like that, uh, or some other um, very conservative church school, uh, and and even then. What's he going to do when he gets out in the real world? Patrick Henry College. Okay. Now, or Hillsdale. Hillsdale is very conservative, though it's not a public. It's it's a uh, uh, not church owned by any means. But um, you know, uh, 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 
you know, at the same time, I think in a junior, in a senior high class, I think a teacher's going to be very careful about pushing an agenda. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, this looks to me, you know, kind of agenda-driven. Um, but it's not and, this quote you know, about He Jesus, complained though. about it, but they said, you know, the administer bunch of administrators and teachers and parents evaluated the book and said, oh, well, we think it should stay in the curriculum. So it's still there. So, I mean, at this point, you're going to sit there and go, hey, you know what? Uh, they're not listening to me. They don't really care. And so um, maybe I should just pull out of here. And, you know, and I can understand this. It says no matter what you believe politically, this book should not belong in the classroom. It's really inappropriate for their age. All right. Um, all right. I haven't read the book. I would think at that age, 16, um, I, I would think that it may be appropriate for their age, just not that particular setting um, in a public school. Um, more it's because of the politics. Talk- yeah, I don't know. Um, I could see reading it as, okay, we're learning about, um, mm. you know, we're learning about this particular um, perspective on economics and then reading a sort of counter perspective. Mm-hmm. I could see that. Right. Well, I mean, and, you know, she, you know, investigate, you know, the impact of the 1996 willful reform on the working poor. Well, hey, Barbara, when they were on welfare, they were the non-working poor. <laughs> I mean, they they were, were, and that was generational. There were several you know, people, you know, I, I, I knew those people down in the Ozarks. I mean, you know, it'd be, you know, second generation, it'd be hitting beginning third generation of people on welfare, never held a job. Uh, you know, they were poor. I mean, you know, it was a sad, very sad situation. Um, and... Up in, when I was in, I remember seeing a, a situation where somebody was in Milwaukee and Chicago collecting welfare under, in both states. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. No, of uh, course, that's not always the case. Yeah. You know, there's, no. there's people on both sides of that. But I mean, what it comes down to is, I, if, if a, if a classroom, a public school classroom, in this case, the thing that they're specifically pointing out is, um is is this reference to Jesus All right I wouldn't consider a negative reference to Jesus a reason to pull somebody out of a class but it sounds like there's more than that going on and it's really it's sort of about the headline that they're grabbing but if you sort of if you if you read this and what they talk about is they're talking about the whole the book as a whole and not just this one quote you know I mean I can understand I I don't want my kid to have to constantly deal with this. And, and and so here's the difference. All right, On the one hand, kids need to learn how to think critically, including thinking critically about what their teachers tell them. All right? and, and I tell my kids that don't believe everything your teachers teach you. All right? Think about what they say. And if it's right, then fine. You know, you're there to learn. But at the same time, they're not perfect, and there's going to be times where they teach you stuff that you know is not right. And um, and so, when at the, those times, you know, I want them to to learn how to think because eventually they're going to be out on their own, and they're going to be hearing all sorts of different perspectives, and they need to know how to process that stuff. And um, and so, you know, there have been times where I've said, you know what, this is a learning experience for you. Not necessarily learning what the teacher's trying to teach you, but you're still going to learn from it, and, and you're going to come out having benefited from it. At the same time, like, I mean, one time, uh, one of my daughters was um, in a class where the teacher was very political. It was a history class, and, and, um, and she was the only student in her class that wasn't just taking everything that he was saying hook, line, and sinker. And it was very frustrating for her, and she really dreaded that class. Um, and and it was, I mean, I was ready to go and talk to the teacher, and, and she said, you know, by the time it was to the point where she was coming to us and saying, wow, this is really irritating, the class was almost done, and and, and she said, oh, well, or, or no, it was the, the particular unit uh, that they were in um, was 
it was it was almost done. And she's like, then we're going to move on to a different unit, and and the stuff that he's talking about isn't really going to, um, you know, he'll get off the subject then, and and so it's just a couple more days, so don't worry about it. And uh, but you know, so it was a good experience for her, good learning experience, learning how to, um, what to do when you're inundated with this kind of stuff, and and learning how to act respectful to the teacher, um, even when he was doing things that were not very respectful and. Um, you know, and, and things like that. Don't you have any respect for yourself? Yeah, it sounds like you know. You know what the problem is? They teach these these parents are religious zealots, and the thing about religious zealots is you just cannot reason with them. <laughs> Wasn't this a fun blog to read? <laughs> Golly, Forbes. <laughs> Yeah, from Forbes no longer, or no less. I just couldn't get over this this thing. What well, was it at Forbes that said that uh, that Cleveland's the most miserable city in the world to live in, or in the country at least? I, think it was. I don't know. So they're not real popular around here. You will find that it is you who are mistaken. Even though people are moving out of Cleveland en masse into North Ridgeville. <laughs> so, like, well, I'm okay with it, because... We've got people pouring in here, and that gives us a tremendous opportunity to reach out to them with the gospel. So, um, I, I'm sad for the people that live in Cleveland that are, you know, struggling with financial problems and, and things like that. But, um, but anyway, uh, back to this blog. Um, what they're, what they're talking about is uh, an artist. I printed this out too small. Um, uh, what's his name? I will name him George, and I will hug him and pet him and squeeze him. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's a, a piece of art called A Fire in My Belly um, by David... Wajanarit. W-O-J-N-A-R-O-W-I-C-Z. So it might be Wurzkevich. There's... God only knows how you pronounce these. All right. Uh, I know we've got uh, some uh, Eastern Europeans Slavic, watching this. Yeah, East European names there, but. <laughs> so, if somebody knows how to pronounce this, all right. Uh, people, who, they've got more. The only thing worse is, is Welsh in terms of adding more vowels and consonants than you possibly need. <laughs> okay. And this is actually, it is a, um, it's a video. Um, piece of artwork that shows a um it's a, a where Christ's body is being eaten up by ants and it's supposed to be it it symbolizes um disgusting uh social violence the ravages of aids which ultimately killed the artist um, and the pains of his own personal tragic history. So it's okay. Here's the thing about the artwork: even though it's it's using this image, um, it's not actually intended to be an anti-Christian um, sort of image. It's it, he's just using this picture of Jesus or whatever as a um. um as, as a symbol. Touchdown Packers, by the way. Yep. I knew that before you did, so I just didn't say anything. <laughs> New England will pull it out. So, but, uh, uh, you know, so, so that it, it really kind of asks an interesting question, though, that, um, all right, can a picture of Jesus be used in art without it being religious or anti-religious. Oh, good grief. Or, you know, or, or, or how much can you do with the picture of Jesus before it's um, sacrilegious? Right. Well, I, 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 okay. You know, at the same time, it's still a, you know, I mean, I, you know, uh, 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 <sighs> Concentrate, Pinky. Concentrate. At the same time, it's still offensive. 
Now, we're supposed to be in the, you know, place in society where you, you know, you don't offend people. You know, I mean, um, so either you're going to, you know, in, you know, hey, and, and again, once again, you know, if you're going to, you know, you know, why, why put Jesus, why have a crucified Jesus and, you know, why not have, you know, show Muhammad get eaten up by the, the ants, you know? Then you could really show your anger at society. Yeah, you wouldn't have to wait for AIDS to kill you either. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, he was already—he's already dead. But I mean, it's—it's well, it's a. He wasn't when he made this this artwork, though. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm not even sure how you know a bunch of ants eating, you know, Jesus after he died. I'm not even sure how the, how you would necessarily even consider that to be artwork, um, you know. Um, and you know, once again, and and, and but the, you know, one of the questions, you know, is is not it, the other question is is okay. This was being funded, you know, it's in the National Portrait Gallery, which is funded by taxpayers. So I should have to pay money to be insulted, right? You know, nobody's stopping. You know, nobody they can hold a private exhibition of his work. Nobody's going to stop that. They can pay for it. You don't. You want it? You pay for it. But what do you think I should have to turn around and pay for it? You know, um, but I just really didn't like this this person's attitude. You know, for those of us who value reason above all things, there are few efforts more frustrating, more irritating, more infuriating than this. Well, you know, well, but it's just not this. That's what. Yeah, that's the other thing is she's trying to take this in isolation to some other very anti-Christian pieces of art that have been subsidized by uh, taxpayers over, you know, over the course of time. And this was just one more thing as far as, the, as, far as a lot of, Christ- you know, Christians on the right were concerned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sort of ongoing, repeated, um, you know, anti... Not, and, and again, not even necessarily anti-Christian, but certainly anti... Uh, uh, or disrespectful, All right? All right. And and the thing is, you can do things. You can use Jesus in artwork. In ways that are not necessarily religious, but respectful. All right. For instance, you could take, right, you know, those collage pictures where you've got a whole bunch of different um, pictures of, of different people, um, and it, and then they're all like combined to make one big picture. So I I made one of those composite pictures one time um, with the members of my congregation, like from the fo- the member photo directory mm-hmm. and and some other pictures from events. Um, I used the uh, iPhoto's faces, and I, I extracted. I took all those faces, and um, and used those using a picture of uh, uh, it's a uh, the crucifixion, and to say. When Jesus died, he died for all of you. And, um. Touchdown, New England. Oh, we're still in the lead. Um. And, uh. All right. So now that was for a specifically religious point. Okay. Um. But what if you. What if you. It was like a, a hunger. Uh. Feed the hungry kind of group. And they said, uh. We want. They they took like a picture of of like maybe one of those classic, you know, pictures of Jesus, um, you know, white Caucasian Jesus, and uh, and then they take uh, um, like pictures of starving children, and um, and they they do a, a picture of Jesus made up of all these starving children, and and saying um, you know, whenever you uh give to the least of one of these you do it for me or something like that you know you know you could do a picture like that and while that's not technically really a religious thing per se um i mean you could even if you wanted to say jesus was a socialist you could um you could do a picture of jesus in a in a whole bunch of of socialists and uh you know and, and do like a composite of that or i mean i who knows um you know, on the other hand, you can do things that are, on on first glance without context, might 
seem disrespectful. Um, I've done artwork for um, for blog posts and for sermons. Um, one of them I did, I had Jesus being crucified on a dollar sign. Um, and, uh, and another one I had Jesus being crucified on the head of an elephant. And, um, and, but then there was an explanation that went along with it, what this represents. And, uh, and the the elephant one was was one that I was a little bit nervous about using, but people got it because it was we were talking about the elephant in the room and how the gospel can be the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Um, but uh, you know what sort of where's the line, you know, and 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 uh, when when is that line crossed? And. <sighs> This is, you know, I look at this and I go, this is gross. <laughs> right. Now, it's interesting. She says, to their credit, and it is a far more crucial distinction than most people realize, the Christian right has not threatened to bomb the Smithsonian, as Muslim groups did a few years ago. Um, it is a vital distinction, one too overlooked by wide-eyed and pushy-tailed idealists. So she, you know, I guess there's faint praise there. But this is interesting. But if we ask American Muslims to place American values ahead of their Islamic ones, we must expect ourselves to put American values, free expression being the cornerstone of the rest, ahead of any Christian or Jewish ones. Um, except the fact that um, we don't ask Muslims to put American values ahead of Islamic ones. They can value Islamic values all they want. They just have to obey the law doing it. Right. Right, and that's the difference, you know. You know. Um, you know, and I, I would think respect and obedience to the law is not a American value. I would think that's just a. It's what we would uh, call the natural law. <laughs> yeah, this is just something that would just be would expected as being part of a citizen of any society. Yeah, but you know, um, but no, they they can you know they can. As far as I'm concerned, Muslims can have put their views ahead of American values all they want to, so they do it legally. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, you know, Christians should be able to put their values ahead of what we would consider. I mean, you know, I don't know what you would consider American values. Uh, you know, although she said, you know, freedom of expression. Well, I don't have a problem with freedom of expression, mm-hmm. but if it's being, if if I'm paying for it, yeah, yeah, that then that's the problem. That's, that's, that's 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 not censorship. That's that's hey, right. you know what? <laughs> they used to be said, you know, the freedom of the press is if you've got the press, you're free to do whatever you want with it. But doesn't mean you have to print in something somebody else wants, you know. And uh, if you're coming to the taxpayer for money, so the taxpayer has the right to say, no, we're not funding you. That's not censorship. That's just saying that's just you ain't getting dime from us. Yeah, you can you know? go ahead and do it. I'm not going to pay you to do it. <laughs> right. Otherwise, you know, gosh, I think you and I should apply. And, you know, and see, you know, if we get money for, for, for this podcast, or this if they is, don't give us money, that's censorship. I think it's a work of art. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't say that with a straight face. <laughs> what is this guy? Crazy? I mean, I've got a gold halo floating around me right now. <laughs> At least that's what it's like on my screen, you know. So I don't know, but but you know, I mean, you know, that's the one. That's the other part too. Is how do you define what is and what is not a uh, um, a uh, um, not only a work of art, but uh, yeah, how do you define art? Mm-hmm. And you know, so there's a whole bunch of things I think there that need to be uh, looked at and, and discussed as you try to deal with this. Uh, speaking of a right to say, nah, we're not going to, let's go over to iTunes. Yep. The iTunes store. Um, all right. So you may or may not have heard it if you're a fan of Chuck Colson um, and uh, say, for instance, the Breakpoint uh, commentaries that um, I actually listened to that podcast and um, 
sometimes agree with him and sometimes not. And, um, but I, I, I think that it's interesting and it's also a good, um, he hits on a lot of the good religious news articles. Um, but, uh, the, uh, he's been, uh, proponent of the Manhattan Declaration, um, which is basically, it's a, it's a call for, um, for our country to move to, um, sort of biblical values to uphold, um, traditional marriage and it's, uh, um, to get rid of, uh, abortion and, you know, those sort of hot button, um, sort of Christian political issues. Okay. Which are important. And, you know, and I've read the Manhattan Declaration and while I haven't sort of digitally signed it, um, I, I think I pretty much agree with everything that's in there. Maybe. Probably. Um, most but, likely. But what they did is they, they put this, um, in an iPhone app. And, um, and so it, it's, you can download this app and, and you can, um, you can read the declaration. You can use it right there to, to, to add your name to the signatories list. And, uh, it has more information, links, and, um, and it also had a quiz to see sort of whether, um, how close are you to being in alignment with this, um, with the, the beliefs and statements in the Manhattan Declaration. And so, um, after a bunch of people complained about it and said it was offensive, even though according to Apple's rating system, this isn't user ratings, this is um, how, how it was rated based on the quality of the app, um, it was given four out of five stars. Um, and, but it was pulled because people complained that it was offensive. Um, now, it's important to note that while it does say that we uphold um, traditional one man, one woman for life marriage. Um, it does not, um, it, 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 it also talks about how we need to reach out to, um, to people who are homosexuals or I forget exactly how it's worded. Okay. But, um, but it, it's, it, you know, it talks about respecting each other and, and things like that. And it doesn't encourage violence or discrimination or, you know, or anything else like that. It, it, strictly talks about um god's understanding of of marriage and um and what's a god pleasing relationship and that and and so um so yeah some people got offended by it and it was pulled well now um they are resubmitting it to the um to the iTunes store um without the quiz cuz apparently the quiz that asks whether a user supports marriage equality um, or abortion, and gave them a score based on the right number of answers. And um, and the, they said that was what offended people because it was sort of saying you're right, you're wrong, or this is how right you are. You know, you know when you download this thing that it supports a particular viewpoint. So you got to expect that all of the stuff contained in it is going to support that particular viewpoint. And if you don't agree with that viewpoint, don't download the app. It's a free app. And it's not like it comes preloaded on your iPad or iPhone. You have to go looking for it, find it, download it, install it on your device, and then launch it and start poking around. I don't know. To me, this sounds like people complaining about, um, oh, well, I went to this Republican um, website, and they said bad things about President Obama. Duh. <laughs> That's what they do, you know. Um, so... I don't understand there you know there's a, a pretty serious question about why it was pulled when it was initially um allowed. All right. On the one hand, Apple has the option to say yes, we're going to, you know, we can sort of arbitrarily decide what goes in and what doesn't. 
right, for some software developers is a huge problem because they'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars um, developing an app, and then all of a sudden Apple can say, not just here you need to tweak this, but no, there's no way this app is ever getting into the store. Well, there's all your money down the tubes, and it's not like the Android platform where you can develop it and and if if the various uh, download stores don't like it or whatever, fine. I'll just put it out there on the web and people can download it that way. You know, with Apple, it's all or nothing unless you jailbreak it and most people aren't willing to do that because Apple could turn around and break your phone. So, and and this is something that, that caught my attention because we have... Um, and Shepherd of the Ridge has an iPhone app in development, um, and and in fact, it's it's ready to go. It's going to be submitted very soon, and um, and it most of the content on it is, is just right off of our website. But I have stuff on the website about our position on on marriage and God's understanding of marriage and things like that. And there's probably other things. And I have uh, I talk about the value of human life and, you know, and, and all, corn, all kinds of stuff. And some people are going to be offended by some of the stuff I said. So does that mean if they pulled the Manhattan Declaration one, that um, the work that I put into developing an app for our church, that that's going to get pulled too? You know, what about Mars Hill just came out with a version 2.0 of their app? And they're pretty conservative, you know. So, um, what, uh, why is theirs up and this one's down, you know? Shut up! Oh, come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help, I'm being repressed! Yep, those are all very good questions. But Apple is a private company and they have every right to say yes to you, no to you. Mm -hmm. They Unless, don't have to be fair. All right, but, but here's the question. All right, there are certain things you cannot discriminate for. Right, there's certain viewpoints. All right, so if it's a uh, um, okay, they could choose. What are we going to do tomorrow night? If 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 they say no, you can't, because your app says that um that you shouldn't discriminate against black people and um. And and we as Apple think that it is okay to discriminate against black people. Then you'd have a problem. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. All right, not that that would ever happen, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to. There are certain viewpoints. You know, you can't you can't choose not to put it in there because <laughs> because the company's racist. Um. You can't choose, you know, if... I'm trying well, to think of another example. Uh-oh. I can't think of one. Yeah, I guess I don't, don't think that's a very good example. <laughs> Basically, there's, there's certain viewpoints that you have to accept. Um... As a, as a company, you know, in other words, on a sort of, you can't say our restaurant doesn't serve black people. We don't serve their kind here. Even though it's privately, um, it's a privately owned, or or we don't hire um, black people, or, or we don't hire um, Christians. You know, that's sort of happened. Um, but but you can't you can't do that. I'm afraid I can't do that. And so so the question is how how much can they how much can Apple discriminate based on ideology? Sir, one more outburst, I will strangle you with my microphone. Yeah, but the difference between race and ideology are are two completely different things. This is true. You can change your ideology, and, you can't change your race. And so, you know, they, they actually have that, you know. So, but we will see how it goes. We will see what happens and see if they uh, re-allow it. Um, personally, I don't think 
see any reason why they should. Um, you know, I, I can see them arguing, look, you have this quiz on here, and this quiz tells, you know, it says, here's the right answer. You know, uh, you know, kind of, kind of almost like a push pull. But now that that's been removed, you know, or maybe they should just, you know, have a, an app that does nothing and charge a thousand dollars for it. Oh, that's been done already. <laughs> yeah, I know. As I said, yeah. Uh, and they pulled that app too. Come to think of it. Yep, they I did. Mean, why? You know, it had no um, had no um, viewpoint. Had nothing. It just spent a bunch of money for something that did sat there and did nothing. Well, and that was a quality control thing. Mm-hmm. That their their whole thing is we we're trying to have all you know good quality apps and and not junk in our store well, that's, that's exactly what it was supposed to it was a perfectly it was a perfect <laughs> app it did exactly what it was supposed to do it ate your money <laughs> and that's what it was made for but yeah and some people actually bought it too <laughs> just say they could well, hey, folks, this brings us up to our last, uh, the end of our, our last podcast before um, the end of the year, before yep. the beginning of 2011. We've now survived the first decade of the 2000s. Um, and so, um, lose me another year close to retirement. And... All right. Hey, uh, we did get some feedback, though, from George. Um, he said, Pastor Jim and Dale isn't holiday derived from Holy Day. We were talking about that whole holiday, Merry Christmas, hap, um, Happy Holidays thing. Um, and uh, he says also, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Uh, remember the objectives about, and he uses a X or a Kai. Um, we talked about that, what, probably last year. Um, people said Jesus isn't Mr. X. Oh, but he is for those who know some biblical Greek. Again, I enjoyed your next to last podcast for 2010, God's Richest Blessings in 2011. Best wishes, George. So, George, thanks for the note. Appreciate that. And wish you as well a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And, and to all of our, our viewers and listeners, we're going to take a couple weeks off to just uh, relax, spend some time with our family and that. Um, and uh, so we'll see you again in uh, in 2011. I'm, I'm expecting, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to next year. Uh, just for all kinds of reasons, I I got uh, I I see a lot of really amazing things happening here at Shepherd of the Ridge that I'm very excited about. Um, you know, some of it's sort of already in place, but a lot of it hasn't. We haven't even started with it yet. Um, and I'm just I'm I'm just anxious to get that stuff going. I just can't wait. It's going to be really really cool. And so, uh, you are, our um, viewers and listeners, uh, you'll hear me talking about it. Um, but I'm just, I'm really looking forward to it, but I'm also, you know, I'm also looking forward to Christmas. Um, not only I, on the one hand, I'm, I'm looking forward to having some time to spend with my family because, uh, I've been spending a lot of my time just doing things like, uh, writing sermons and, and things like that. Um, really kind of cramming to get everything done. Uh, before Christmas, and uh, at the same time, though, uh, I you know Christmas is just such an exciting holiday because of the um, you know the this is the celebration when God became a human being when He came to be with us, and uh, mm-hmm. and something in my uh, one of my Christmas sermons I, I talk about how uh, you know people have a hard time with this concept of 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 a, a God who is greater than the universe who existed before there was such a thing as time and, um, you know, and, and, and beyond the universe. And how could such an, an infinite God, um, care at all about our individual lives? But that's thinking from our perspective because I sent the, um, I sent the president a Twitter message. And I'll bet you he never even read it. I certainly didn't hear back from him. And uh, and because he has to prioritize. God doesn't have to prioritize. 
He can get personally deeply involved in each of our lives and um and and not sort of all of a sudden you know galaxies go flying off because he's not paying attention or something like that right um and so but that's what he's chosen to do, and even when we don't deserve it, and I think boy, you know you you've got the angels right <laughs> and and they're all you know holy and pure and all that kind of stuff, but God gets involved in our dirty lives that are all full of sin and muck, and I think, man, who'd want to do that? <laughs> you know, but He does. And, he did, and and I mean, boy, He got right in there with us, um, in a in a way that was just amazing, and um, and is still involved in our lives, and and just just that whole concept is just mind boggling. But it's so cool. Hmm. That it is. Speaking of things that are very cool, New England just took the lead, twenty-one seventeen. <laughs> oh man, what a way to go out! <laughs> we need to drag this out a little longer, I think. No, we're not going to drag it out for another 90 minutes. But uh, we'll let Dale, when he edits it, he can put an addenda at the end. Final score. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and the final score, and then be a Jim's team wins. So, you know. <laughs> if New England, look, New England is not doing all that well, considering the fact that Aaron Rodgers is out. If Aaron Rodgers were in, you guys wouldn't stand a chance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 what Chicago thought last week, and didn't do them too well. Well, so at least we, at least at least you can say, you know, you're just as good. You just did the same thing Chicago did and lost to the best team in the league. So you know. <laughs> we shall see. All right. Well, everybody, have a merry Christmas. Uh, oh, feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, leave a comment. Um, Send us a message. We keep getting all these spam messages on YouTube. It's really irritating. Um, so send us a real message and uh, let us know what you think. Um, you know, what are you, what are you celebrating and why? Uh, you celebrate Festivus with your aluminum pole or, or what? And uh, you know, so we'd love to hear from you. Offer us your thoughts. And um, and a, just a reminder: uh, if you if you use iTunes, uh, pop over. And leave a review on either the audio or the video feed, and uh, and just you know not only let us know what you think, but let everybody else know what you think too. So we'd appreciate that. So good night, everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and God bless. Mm-hmm.